Well, let's consider once again the Lissajou curve example that we considered on Monday. And we will look at the plot again, but now I would like to bring vectors into play to help us understand what's going on with the Lissajou curve example. The initial setup is the same as before. X equals F of T, Y equals G of T are my parametric equations. The Lissajou curve that I'm considering is when F of T equals cosine of 3T and G of T equals sine of 5T. And that uh, is only one example of infinitely many different Lissajou curves. That's just the example that I happen to pick. I've talked about how these parametric equations, considered as two separate equations, can be combined into a single point equation before. We can say x, y as a point in rectangular coordinates has coordinates that depend on time. And they are, again, these particular functions, cosine of t, 3t and sine of 5t. But now, I want you to realize, I'm trying to teach you, in case you didn't realize, that instead of thinking of this as a point moving around the plane, we think of it as a changing vector. But when we think of it as a changing vector, we use different notation. What is a vector? Geometrically, a vector is an arrow that's got a certain length called its magnitude and a certain direction that it's pointing in. It's not clear yet what the relationship is between the point and the vector. I'm going to try to make that clear as we go. Notationally, well, terminology-wise, we call it the position vector. Position vector. Notationally, by hand, and in our textbook, in fact, we write the function name and we put a little arrow above the function name, either a full arrow or if we're feeling lazy, like I am, a half arrow. Most people are lazy and put a half arrow, but we could put a full arrow above the function name. I think the book does a full arrow. But many textbooks don't bother with the arrow and they just make it bold-faced. Bold-faced for vectors. Can't really make a bold face so well by hand. So we resort to an arrow or a half an arrow to indicate that this is a vector quantity that we want to imagine as being an arrow in the plane. But it's a function of t, so it will be a changing arrow, not a constant arrow, not always the same direction, not always the same length. It's components, and you typically do say components here instead of coordinates, are f and g, the same exact functions. Notationally, what our book does, and I think this is probably the best notation for our purposes, is instead of using parentheses, using pointy brackets. But what goes inside the pointy brackets is still the same kind of thing. These two functions, f of t and g of t. Do you have to use pointy brackets? In our class, yes, I want you to. But outside of this class, you should know people don't always use pointy brackets. Sometimes they go ahead and just use parentheses again. But I think it's worthwhile to make the distinction here conceptually because the parentheses refer to points, dots moving around, and pointy brackets refer to arrows that are changing over time. They change direction, they change length. In other classes, like differential equations with linear algebra, we write our vectors as column vectors. I've mentioned that before. That's a side comment. In that class, we would write it like this. That has a benefit too, for the purposes of multiplying a matrix times a vector, it's better to write it as, it's called a column vector, like that. What do you typically do in physics? In physics, you typically use what are called the standard unit vectors, i and j, or i hat and j hat. 
to write this in yet another way. f of t times i, I will write an i hat like that because that's what my physics teachers did. And a j with a hat, i hat and j hat. Our textbook doesn't use hats. Our textbooks, our textbook uses arrows. It's a little faster to make a hat. And when you make the hats, you don't typically bother making the dots. That's an I hat. That's a J hat, in spite of the fact that there's no dots. It's just, you know, why bother? That's kind of the, the uh, philosophy there. What are I hat and J hat, though? They're what are called standard unit vectors. They are arrows that in a standard coordinate system in the plane where you got the origin picked, you got an x-axis going directly left and right with the positive direction to the right, and a y-axis going up and down with the positive direction upward, your standard coordinate systems. I-hat points directly to the right with a length of one, and J-hat points directly upward with a length of one. So let's pretend this arrow is I hat, and this arrow here is J hat. It's a length of one. So I've started these arrows to be based at the origin. That's where their tails are. The start of the vector, the base is called the tail of the vector. And then the end or tip of the vector is called the head, tail to head. If I put the tails at the origin, then the head of I hat is at the point one zero, and the head of J hat is the, at the point zero one. Let's pretend at a particular value of T, at a particular value of T, that, okay, this is not the exact same example anymore. I'm doing, I'm not thinking in terms of cosine and sine, that F of T is, uh, three and G of T is two. So this is not the same example as the Lissajous curve because cosine and sines you know, have to be between negative one and one. So it's not the same. It's just for the illustration purposes of this picture. If at a particular value T, F of T is three and G of T is two, then the vector r of t is going to have components three comma two in i hat j hat notation that's three times i hat plus two times j hat and what you want to imagine is you want to imagine taking i hat and scaling it up by a factor of three to be three times as long say right about to here that's three i hat. And this point here has coordinate x equals three. And scale j hat up so it's twice as long because it's got a coefficient of two. There's two j hat. And this y coordinate is two right there. And their sum, three i hat plus two j hat, is found by something called the parallelogram law which in this situation, since these vectors are perpendicular to each other, is really a rectangle. Make this rectangle, which is a parallelogram, draw that point. Their sum, three i hat plus two j hat, is this arrow right there. That's three i hat plus two j hat. In our notation that we'll use mostly, we could also write it like that. Notice I have chosen the arrow to start once again to be based at with its tail at the origin. If I do that, the rectangular coordinates of this point are three comma two. So the components of the vector match the coordinates of the point. That's not an accident. 
But with vectors, it's important to realize you want to have the flexibility to translate them around and still consider them to be the same vector. That's useful. In particular, this arrow that goes from here to here can also be thought of as 2j hat. And this arrow that goes from here to here can also be thought of as 3i hat. And with component notation, 3i hat is 3 comma 0, and 2j hat is 0 comma 2. With the components notation, the order does matter. If I'm talking about this vector, I have to write it as 3, 2, not 2, 3. With the i hat and the j hat, vector addition is commutative. I can rewrite this as 2j hat plus 3i hat. And that's the same vector. What matters is what's the numbers next to the i hat and what's the numbers next to the j hat. The three is next to the i hat. That corresponds to the first component. The two is next to the j hat. That corresponds to the second component, even though I've written them in the opposite order here. Coming back to the Lissajous example, once I've got a position vector like this, I will now use this notation. Well, okay, I will I will go back and forth with the i hat and j hat notation as well still. I can compute something called its velocity vector. What's the velocity vector? Hey, how about the derivative of the position vector? What? Differentiate a vector? Well, not a constant vector, although you could differentiate such a vector, a constant vector to zero. It's a changing vector, it's changing direction and length. Maybe in a nice, continuous, smooth way. Maybe it's got a nice derivative. Yeah, it does. If f and g are nice functions. It would be the derivative of the position vector. I could write r prime of t. Or if I prefer in Leibniz notation, dr dt. And by definition, this is found by differentiating f and g individually, creating a new vector whose components are the derivatives of the original. That's an R notation. I could also write this in I hat and J hat notation. And here's the punchline, a, cu a couple punchlines. When you give yourself the freedom with the velocity vector to not have its tail at the origin, but instead have it at the location of the particle, say, as it's moving, and so it's it's not only changing the length and direction, it's also changing where the tail is. It will always point tangent to the curve, and its length will be the speed. Those are the two key points. It'll always point tangent to the curve, and its length will be the speed. If I start to draw this Lissajous curve, for example, by hand, say, I start getting a curve like this, Maybe at a particular moment in time, I'm right there. So the coordinates of that point would be f of t comma g of t. The position vector for this, you'd want to have its tail at the origin. Its head, its tip will be at the location of the particle at that moment in time. That arrow right there will be r of t. The velocity vector, the derivative of the position vector, you want to start at the particle's location at that moment in time. And it'll point tangent to the curve in the direction of motion and have a length equal to the speed. That would be V of T there. And the fact that the length is equal to the speed helps us understand one of the formulas on your homework assignment. The magnitude or length of V of T, which I haven't looked ahead to see how our, how our textbook denotes this. You can denote with either single absolute value signs or double. They use double, I like that. <laughs> 
denoted by double absolute value sine of V of T is found essentially by the, applying the Pythagorean theorem to V of T. This is, this is the punchline right, right here. Essentially, you know, you got this arrow here. You could draw a right triangle in here and apply the Pythagorean theorem to it. Its length by the Pythagorean theorem is the square root of the sum of the squares of the length of the sides. The lengths of the sides are absolute value of f prime and absolute value of g prime. And since you're squaring, you don't need the absolute values. You can write f prime of t squared plus g prime of t squared. F prime and G prime are the components of the velocity vector. They could be positive or negative, but when you square them, that's like squaring their magnitudes. Doesn't matter, you don't need absolute value signs. Add them up, take the square root. Essentially, that's the Pythagorean theorem giving you this length. And the other important thing about this, and I hope this is intuitive, I'm not proving it, is this quantity is there for the speed. The speed is the magnitude of the velocity. That's essentially a definition. This is the speed as a function of t. It's not a constant speed in general. And I don't know if you had me for Calc 1 or Calc 2. I think most of you did not. But if any of you did, one thing I really emphasize a lot with integrals in Calc 1 and Calc 2 is that the integral of the speed is the distance traveled. Maybe your teacher emphasized that, maybe they didn't. The distance traveled in section 9.3, this is called arc length, is the integral of the speed. over whatever time interval we're talking about, in general, A to B. And if you use the formula for the speed, you get the formula for the arc length that's in the book. So all of this that we did with vectors, for the moment, was just to intuitively justify this formula for the arc length which is the distance traveled along the curve. I also had an ulterior motive, and that was just to introduce vectors. Let me quick show you that this can be visualized in Mathematica as well, pretty nicely. And let's also do the integral to find the arc length or distance traveled in Mathematica as well. The integral is gonna be pretty much impossible to do by hand, so we have to rely on technology, whether it's Mathematica or a calculator. So here's the list of your figure. These are the functions. Manipulate code was to see the animation of the motion. Slow it down so you can see it better. And it's faster in the straightaways and slower in the curves. My ultimate goal here is to figure out how far did the particle go? Or if, you, if this is you traveling around in your car in a parking lot, how far did you travel? Of course, it depends on units too. We need to figure out the speed. What is the speed? Um, let's go ahead and type it in as a function. I'll call it speed of t. I've got the formulas for f and g. I've got to take the square root of f prime of t squared plus g prime of t squared. Imagine doing that in your head. f prime is going to be negative 3 sine 3t. g prime is going to be positive 5 cosine 5t. Square those, negative 3 squared is 9, 5 squared is 25. The formula is 25 cosine of 5t quantity squared plus 9 sine of 3t quantity squared. 
that's a function that gives you the length of the velocity vector at any moment in time. If you graph it, it's a pretty wild function, as you would expect. There are lots of speeding up and slowing downs along that listed curve. There's what it looks like. Uh, here, it did not, Mathematica did not put the origin in, in the right spot, but I can fix that. Axes, origin, zero, zero fixes that. There we go. Speed is never zero. It's minimized where these graph, the graph is lowest and maximized where it's highest. So you could kind of count curves in straightaways here. Straightaways where you have high points and tight curves where you have low points. Doesn't look like this would be easy to integrate, does it? Yeah, in fact, if you try to have Mathematica integrate the speed, uh, it thinks and thinks and thinks, and it eventually gives up. Mathematica can't even do it. Why? Can't Mathematica do anything? It can't do impossible things. It can be proved, I believe, that it's impossible to integrate this function. What, what do I mean when I say impossible? I mean, you can't find a simple formula for the integral in terms of what are called elementary functions. That does not mean the integral does not exist. It exists as a more abstract function, but that function has no simple formula. Instead, you'd have to approximate it. How do you approximate integrals? Yeah, Mathematica gave up. How do you approximate integrals in Mathematica? Use n integrate. The n stands for numerical integration. The interval needs to go from zero to two pi in general, though I'm gonna, I, what, notice what I'm doing here is I'm defining a distance function of t. That actually means I want the upper limit of the integral to be t. What should I call my variable? Mm, anything you want, maybe u. This will define a function of t that I can then plug numbers in like 2 pi to figure out distance traveled. Over 2 pi units of time along that listed curve, the arc length is about 24.6. You traveled about 24.6. Well, the units, I don't know. It's you driving in a car. Those would be some pretty tight curves to, to consider that to be feet or meters. Okay, you walking. That, that listed your curve is you walking and, and running around there. And then the units are, say, meters. This would be in meters, if that were the case. You can also plot the distance function once I've and integrated it. It's doing a lot of numerical integrations. That's why it takes a while, but it does produce a plot. There it is. And the derivative of that is the speed. What I'm really doing here is I'm emphasizing to me one of the most important points of the first three chapters in conjunction with showing you the formula in for your homework, do pride. Your integrals, well, in general, they can be difficult to do. They could be tricky. The integrals you have to do for Friday could be tricky. I will double check and see if they can all be done by hand. Hopefully they can. Dr. Yang didn't mention they can't, but I'll double check for you. And if there are any that seem extra tricky, I might send you some hints. In general, these kinds of integrals involving square roots are tricky to do. You might have to use some factoring and maybe substitution, maybe trig substitution. They can be pretty tricky to do the integrals, but you should work at doing some by hand if not all of them, they might all be possible. 